keep your head down, and work harder than everyone else. That is the advice that my father has always given me. But one day, in the early part of my career, I received a different message. I was a junior credit analyst at Moody's, and one afternoon, as I was leaving one of our weekly credit rating meetings, a white male colleague came to me and set me aside and said in a sober tone, you know, we want to hear your opinion. It doesn't do anyone any good for you just to sit there quietly. I was mortified. I knew that every credit rating analyst was expected to contribute to decisions, irrespective of seniority. In theory, a great place to hone your voice. But I was just learning how to find my footing in an unfamiliar corporate environment. It wasn't lost on me that in most meetings, I was usually the only Latinx woman and youngest person. I was working so hard to hone my credit rating skills, the hard work that mi papa had told me to do, while trying to navigate an environment that was very white. White in terms of demographic representation across all levels. White in terms of the corporate identity that I was expected to adopt in order to survive. An identity that meant that there was not a trace of an accent to be heard, or that in my appearance, there could not be a sense of too much ethnicity or over-sexualization. I took a deep, deep breath, and before I knew it, started sharing with him all of the insecurities that I had been harboring for months, the anxiety that I had felt at my experience not being quite as valuable as others because I was young. The burden that I carried at not supporting anyone's stereotypes about me being a Latina and how hard I found it trying to figure out how to show up in a predominantly white male dominated culture. Mi hija, keep your head down and work harder than everyone else. That is the message that kept on running through my head, but it wasn't enough. My body shook, my heart ached. I couldn't look him in the eye, but he looked at me. And in that moment, everything changed. I was able to share my truth with him and he listened. He really listened. And instead of dismissing me by saying, oh, that's all in your head. He took a moment to hear, see, and value me. And instead of assuming what it was like to be in my shoes, he actually took a moment to dismiss his judgment, to understand where I was coming from, to interpret the information he was hearing, and then to devise a plan to help reduce obstacles that I was facing. This is what he said. I hear how lonely you feel. I think what is holding you back is a fear of messing up. I have felt that too, but I get that it is different for you. But here's what I also know. You're not going to get over it unless you work through it. And you're going to need someone to support you. He then offered to sit next to me at our next meeting and to amplify my comments because the deal was that I would speak up. This was the beginning for both of us, the beginning of an allyship journey. Much more than an ally, mi aliado, he became my accomplice, mi complice, in challenging the status quo. I would slowly go on to build my bravery muscles by speaking up more proactively in meeting after meeting, while watching him from the corner of my eye, encouraging me to go on. I would learn how to confidently share my opinion even when it wasn't popular, how to hold space the way others did around me. I didn't always have the impact that I wanted, but I found my footing. Much more than an ally, this colleague also became my first professional mirror. He showed me the unvarnished truth 
about my fears and my anxieties and how I could overcome them so that I could build the career that mi papa had envisioned for me. Much more importantly, he sacrificed his own comfort over mine. He sought to learn whose voices were being heard and whose voices were being silenced. That is the true act of solidarity of an ally. Instead of sitting in his own judgment and guilt, he sought ways to overcome the barriers to my success. This life-changing moment inspired me to dedicate the last two decades of my career to designing diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies across global companies. It also reinforced for me what I always knew deep inside, that what leaders do matters far more than what they say. Creating workplaces that work for everyone, ah, it's about far more than public displays on social media diversity recruiting initiatives, and one and done anti-bias and anti-harassment training. I have been really excited to see that there is a very special energy, energia, vibe, mojo, in organizations when employees feel seen, heard, and valued, when they feel that they can contribute, collaborate, perform without judgment and retaliation. It keeps organizations from feeling dark and heavy. It keeps the mistrust out of the air. It keeps talented employees from leaving your organizations. And worse, it keeps those that have to sustain repeated trauma to survive financially. What it does is that it breeds the highest levels of innovation, creativity, and collaboration. I want to share with you three actions that you can take so that your organizations are places where fairness, justice, equity, and inclusion are the experience of all. The first is to hold up a mirror. The second, to act on what you learn. And the third, to persist despite your discomfort. Let's start with holding up a mirror. I was lucky to have someone that was willing to put up a mirror in front of me. I was also strong and brave enough to look in that mirror. The mirror told me, you deserve to be here. It also said that I needed to face my fears and my discomfort. I know firsthand that not everyone is willing to look in that mirror. When I worked at Google, I remember vividly one meeting where I was set to bring about our first diversity hiring strategy. I laid out a detailed proposal of what it would be like to reimagine our hiring process. It was supported by an exhaustive analysis of the hiring experience of black and Hispanic software engineering candidates. My team was so excited to present bold and innovative ideas, including significantly expanding our hiring markets and rebuilding our interview process. But after hours of pushback on our suggestions and this repeated line of questioning from my manager about a seemingly unknown root cause of our inability to hire black and Hispanic software engineers at scale, I nearly lost my mind and blurted out, racism, the root cause is racismo. Our recruitment process was designed with a racist lens, and we need to re-examine and rebuild every stage of our hiring journey if we are to achieve different outcomes. The room went quiet. The discomfort was palpable. This was the mirror no one wanted to look into. The truth no one wanted to see but it was the truth, the truth being reflected at them, and they chose not to act. Awareness without action means nothing. We have got to act on what we learn. Here's the thing about looking in the mirror. It fundamentally requires you to recognize your personal, cultural, and systemic sore spots. You are going to have to reflect 
on your identity in relationship to someone else. And you're going to have to ask for feedback that you may not want to hear. You're going to have to build new muscles, including the ability to interpret new information, to sit in ambiguity, conflict, and discomfort, and to figure out what you will do when you witness bias or when you discover that you have been perpetuating the bias all along. This work, this work comes with pain, this work comes with conflict, this work comes with discomfort. But if you want to drive change, you're going to have to work through that discomfort. Many of us want to change conditions in our workplaces, but sometimes we don't know how to do it. We get stuck in getting worried about, are we going to get it wrong? Are we going to mess this up? Are we not going to do enough? It's that place where many of us often dwell, that paralyzing place of fear and anxiety where we numb ourselves into inaction. Privilege is the ability to be able to look away, to not act when you are confronted with your bias and complicity. But sitting in awareness is not enough. You're going to have to act on what you learn and you're going to have to persist through that discomfort. When I worked at Disney, I was part of a group that helped launch our first women's initiative. That first week when we were planning our programming for Women's History Month, I took a bet that paid off. I sat around the room of mostly well-intentioned white women and realized that the lens through which we were looking at the advancement of women left out the experience of women of color, women like me. I knew what it was like to feel left out and excluded from white social networks. And that also when I was invited, there was always this unstated understanding that I was there to fulfill a quota, not there to share my whole truth. But I had an opportunity to change that. With all of the corporate charm and bravado that I could muster, I proposed designing a program that would focus on the workplace experience of women of color. By this point in my career, I had earned a decent level of confidence. But even then, I knew that I needed to propose this framework as a limited risk proposition. How much attention could this program possibly garner? How many women of color could I possibly bring together? Well, it was one of the most attended programs that month. The women who attended to this day still recall it as the first time that many of them felt seen, heard, and valued. I'll never forget the manager who called me up to say, hey Daisy, I have no idea what you just did, but this young woman on my team just came back from one of your events and she has a pep in her step that I have never seen before. Please do more. Had I not acted on what I knew women of color needed to experience in the workplace, we would have never moved beyond the pervasive blind spot of women's programs only catering to white women, instead of reducing the barriers and clearing the advancement path for all women. But again, this work is hard it is challenging and full of discomfort. When we move past our discomfort, we get to the place of true change. But for some of us, we know that that change comes at a high risk. Some of us know that there is danger in doing so. So instead, we let go of small parts of ourselves. We let our courage shrink and our voice diminish. I have been beaten into submission so many times that I have forgotten the count. I have been layered under toxic managers who have put up roadblocks to my success, taken ownership of my ideas, and questioned my value on a daily basis. Even as I was actively working to bring more seats to the table, 
I have had to fight to earn and keep mine. But I persist. I refuse to give up. And I know that you can too. I know we all can. Porque si se puede. Creating workplaces that work for everyone is hard, complex, and at times emotionally triggering. But it is necessary. It is about reducing the undue burdens and the marginalization that we have allowed to exist, that we have tolerated for hundreds of years, to a place where the emotional energy is vibrant, where employees feel that they are valued, that they matter, that they are essential. When they walk in every day knowing that they have a clear path forward. We can do that if we hold up a mirror, if we act on what we know, and if we persist despite our discomfort. So when my father said, mi hija, keep your head down and work harder than everyone else, he was partially right. This work, it requires all of us to work harder. It takes daily actions, like questioning the lack of diversity on your team, refusing to tokenize black, indigenous, and people of color, and standing up against injustices in your workplace. If we all start being the allies we want to be, to show up and for our colleagues, to do the work, we can drive lasting and meaningful change. Gracias.